Welcome to the talk about the paper Almost Optimal Sublinear Time Edit Distance in the Low Distance Regime. My name is Alejandro Cassis and this is joint work with Carl Brinkman, Nick Fisher and Vasilius Nakos. The edit distance between strings X and Y is the minimum number of character insertions, deletions and substitutions that are needed to transform X into Y. For example, if X is relevant and Y is elephant, then the edit distance is 2 because I can remove R from X and substitute V into H and in this way transform x into y. The edit distance is a natural measure of similarity between strings and therefore has many applications, for example, in bioinformatics or more generally in text processing. So what do we know about computing the edit distance? Well, we all learn a textbook dynamic program which computes it exactly in time n squared. Here and for the rest of the talk, I'm going to denote by n the length of x, which I'm going to assume that is the same as the length of y, just for simplicity. One of the main results of fine grained complexity was showing that essentially this algorithm might be optimal, or more precisely, that under the strong exponential time hypothesis, there is no truly subquadratic time algorithm. This naturally motivates the study of approximation algorithms, where if instead of computing the edit distance exactly, if we allow ourselves to approximate it, then maybe we can uh, overcome this quadratic barrier. And in this, this is the case, and there is a vast literature of approximation algorithms for edit distance. And here I'm just going to show you a couple of results. In particular, I want to highlight that the best approximation factor that we can obtain in subquadratic time is a 3 plus epsilon. And that in time n to the 1 plus epsilon, for any arbitrarily uh, small epsilon, we can get a constant factor approximation where the precise uh, factor depends on epsilon. If we are willing to approximate the edit distance, then instead of aiming for a linear time algorithm, we might as well hope to obtain a sublinear time algorithm, or in other words, it is conceivable that we can estimate the edit distance between two strings without having to read all their characters. So more formally, we're going to study the following problem, which is called the gap edit distance problem, uh, which I'm going to note by k, k times g edit distance, in which we are given random access to strings x and y, and the goal is to distinguish the case between uh, if the edit distance is at most k, in which we say that the strings are close, or if their edit distance is larger than k times g, in which we say that the strings are far. Note that here g stands for the gap between the close and the far case. If the edit distance falls somewhere in between, then the algorithm can output anything. And of course, what we aim here is to minimize the number of accesses to x and y. In particular, we want to get a number of accesses that is smaller than n, so sublinear in n. To get some intuition and context for this problem, let's consider for a moment the case of Hamming distance where recall that the Hamming distance between strings x and y is just the number of positions in which they differ. For the Hamming distance, the gap problem is completely understood in the sense that we have a matching upper and lower bound of n over k times g. And the upper bound is just simply the following. You sample this many number of random positions in both strings and compute the Hamming distance of these subsample strings. If it is at least one, then you output far, and otherwise you just say close. And as I said, this has a matching unconditional lower bound. Unfortunately, the case for edit distance is much less understood, and the known upper bounds are quite far from the known lower bounds, as we are going to see later. Now I want to start by showing you some of the uh, upper bounds that we have for this problem for edit distance. Now, the running times of these algorithms are usually measured in terms of k, g, and n. So, some of these algorithms are hard to compare against each other. Um, and moreover, some of these algorithms have some restrictions on which range of parameters they actually uh, work. So, for example, in this pioneering work by Batu and others in 2003, they showed how to solve the gap edit distance problem in sublinear time namely k squared over n plus square root k. But this only works uh, when the far case, so k times the gap, is at least uh, omega of n. And similarly, there are other results which improve this uh, in some regimes. But as I said, some of these algorithms are hard to compare uh, against each other. Now, the starting point for our paper uh, were the following two questions. <clears throat> First, how far are these 
sublinear algorithms for the gap problem uh, for any distance, how far are these from being optimal? And well, we know that there is a lower bound, which says that to solve the k versus k times g gap problem, you need n over k times g plus square root n time, where this term is essentially the lower bound that I mentioned for Hamming distance. But our best upper bound um, <clears throat> achieves time uh, roughly n over square root k times the gap. So you can see that there is still a large discrepancy between uh, lower and upper bounds. So for example, for the case of um, k versus k squared at a distance, then this upper bound translates to an algorithm which runs in time n over k to the three halves. And this should be con con uh, uh, contrasted with the time that we can solve the same gap for the Hamming distance problem, which is n over k squared. Right, so this question, I mean, and the fact that we are still far from matching the, the, the lower bounds, <clears throat> led us to wonder the following. What is the smallest possible gap such that we can solve the gap problem in the following time budget? So n over k plus polynomial time in k. And uh, essentially the best uh, that was known is this algorithm that I'm mentioning here, which achieves the gap square root k. Now I'm ready to tell you about our result. We give an algorithm which solves the k versus k to the one plus little of one gap at a distance problem in time n over k plus polynomial in k, where the dependence on k is k to the four plus little of one. In particular, I want to stress that this is the first algorithm which gives a subpolynomial gap in the time budget that I mentioned earlier. Moreover, our result shows a surprising similarity between Hamming distance and eddy distance in the so-called low distance regime. So when k is small enough so that the n over k term of our running time dominates uh, the polynomial in k, then this gap problem for both eddy distance and Hamming distance is in roughly time n over k uh, up to a k to little of one factor. And the reason that this is surprising and interesting is that in the case of the large distance regime, so for example, when k is omega of n, then um, the algorithm I mentioned earlier can solve this problem for having distance in essentially constant time. But the lower bound that I mentioned for any distance shows that we need actually a square root of n uh, time for, for this. Meaning that in the large distance regime, there's a separation, but our result shows that in the case of the low distance, actually the complexity of these two problems is very similar. In the remaining of the talk, I wanna give you some of the main ideas behind our algorithm. For this talk, I'm gonna focus on the case where the gap is n to the low of one instead of k to the low of one for simplicity. Our algorithm has three main ingredients. First, we're gonna see that we, instead of focusing on edit distance, we are going to focus on something called the tree distance, which is a good approximation of the edit distance, but turns out to be nicer to work with. Then we're going to see how to use the so-called precision sampling to efficiently approximate the tree distance. Finally, we will add some structural insights and some property testers which actually find these structures to prune the computation tree of the tree distance and in this way obtain the desired sublinear running time. The first two steps, or these two ingredients, are taken from an algorithm by Andoni, Krautgamma, and Onak from 2010, which uh, gave a near, uh, so a near linear time approximation algorithm for edit distance. Our algorithm can be seen as taking their framework and implementing it in a sublinear fashion by uh, essentially the addition of this third step here. So let's start with the tree distance. We're going to fix a BRE tree in which we label the leaves from 1 to n. And given any node v in this tree, we say that v is responsible for the interval from i to j, where i is the leftmost leaf in v subtree and j is the rightmost one. This tree induces a natural partitioning of x into substrings of different lengths corresponding to different levels of this tree. More precisely, for a node v in some level, we will associate the substring xv, which is the substring of x which starts at position i and ends at, at position j, where i and j are uh, is the interval that v is responsible for. Note that in this way, at each level of this partitioning, we have uh, strings of the same length 
And at each level, we have a partitioning of x into blocks of the same length. Now we can uh, define the same uh, construction for y, but we are going to further allow uh, to shift the substrings of y in the following way. So I'm going to denote by y v comma s to be the string, the substring of y, which starts now at position i plus s and ends at position j plus s, where again i and j are um, the interval that the node v is responsible for. So s here can be some parameter that, that just shifts the, posi the starting position uh, of this substring. With this notation, we can define the tree distance, which is recursively defined in the following way. So the tree distance between the strings x and y at a given node v of our tree and for some shift s is the following. Well, if v is a leaf of the tree, then it's just the humming distance between the corresponding characters x, v and y, v, s. And if v has children from uh, v1 through v, v, uh, the tree distance is the following expression, which essentially uh, looks at the tree distances of the children nodes vi and chooses the shifts si, which minimize this expression here, where we look at the recursive uh, tree distance for this choice of shift and we pay for the shift difference between s and the shift si that we are minimizing over. Now, this definition is a little bit hard to parse, so let, let me give you some intuition. You should think of the tree distance between x, v, and y, v, s as some approximation of the edit distance between these two corresponding substrings. And what, what the tree distance will do is try to partition these two substrings into some blocks. And for each of the blocks, we'll try to uh, align it to its corresponding block in the other string by some particular shift, which might differ from the, the shift of the parent, which is s. So, for example, the first block might align uh, in the other string in the following way, where we are going to shift the block, the block in Y by um, another shift of S1 on top of the shift S. And similarly, for each of the other blocks, we choose some uh, different shifts SI. And then the cost at this, at this level is just the sum of the shift differences, um, S minus SI uh, times 2. So that's, that's the idea. Note that the shifts that each block uh, uses might overlap with the other ones. But the point is that we split the computation into some independent uh, subproblems, which is like the key uh, property of this, uh, of this uh, tree distance. So from now on, I'm going to denote by the tree distance uh, of x and y to be the tree distance of x and y at the root node with the shift 0. And the key lemma that uh, Andoni, Krautgamma, and Onag showed was that the tree distance is a good approximation of the edit distance. In particular, it is lower bounded by the edit distance and it is upper bounded by b times the depth of this tree, where again b is the arity of the tree that we are working with. So more precisely, the task that we have now will be the following. At every node b, we are going to compute the tree distance uh, between x and y at this node v for all shifts s that lie in the set minus k to k. And basically the reason that we can restrict uh, ourselves to this, uh, to this set of shifts is that in this definition, since we always pay for some um, for the shift difference and we anyways are only trying to solve the k versus k times n to the little of one gap problem, it doesn't make sense to consider larger shifts than, than this. Now, if you essentially evaluate this expression and try to compute the tree distance exactly, it is not hard to see that this would be too slow. In particular, we would need time essentially n times k. This is not totally obvious, but you can see the details on the paper, especially on how to evaluate this uh, minimization thing here. But clearly this is too slow, so we somehow need to do something uh, much faster. To improve the running time, we are going to allow approximation. More precisely, instead of computing uh, the exact tree distance at a given node, we are instead going to allow some uh, approximation of this. In particular, we are going to be working with approximations that are both additive and multiplicative as captured by the following definition. So we say that x tilde is an alpha beta approximation of x if x tilde is a multiplicative alpha, an additive beta approximation um, of x.
And uh, therefore, the new goal will be to compute an appropriate approximation of the tree distance at every node and, and, and for all the shifts that we said. But now we allow some multiplicative uh, error and some additive error. And in particular, note that it suffices to set the multiplicative error at the root node to be entirely low of 1 and the additive error to be k. Now, the intuition of where are we gaining something here is that if we allow additive error of beta v at some node, then it's conceivable that we can subsample the string that we are looking, like take a random sample with rate uh, 1 over beta v, and uh, by this we incur in some error, so some additive error of beta v, but in this way, uh, hopefully, uh, we don't need to read the entire strings, and this will indeed be the case. But this is just some rough intuition for why this makes sense. Okay, to give a little bit more details, uh, first of all, let me assume for simplicity in this presentation that we can just ignore multiplicative errors. Uh, at the end of the day, things will work out, as we show in the paper, but for now, let's just focus on the additive error. And, uh, well, at the end of the day, recall that this is the expression that we are trying to approximate. And the important thing is that it is a sum. So, I mean, for some choice of the minimizer, we are, we are summing up b different terms. So, we are in the following situation. If we want to allow additive error to be a beta root, which we said uh, that we will set to k, the question is how do we set the additive errors that we allow to uh, the children v1 through vb? Well, maybe the most obvious thing to do would be to just set the additive error to be a beta root over the number of children b. And since we are summing over b things, then this would give essentially an additive error of at most k, uh, which is what we want. Unfortunately, this is too bad because um, if you continue recursively in this way, so setting the, the precision of the children um, again by dividing by b and so on, you can see that uh, for the leaf nodes, we would need to have additive error smaller than 1, or in other words, we would need to compute these uh, leaf nodes exactly, and this would again be too slow. So the question is, how can we do this in such a way that the additive errors that we allow at each uh, uh, node in the, in the tree don't become too small? And it turns out that there is a very beautiful and elegant way of precisely solving this problem, and is using the so-called precision sampling lemma. So the precision sampling lemma due to Andoni, Kraut, Garmin, and Onak says the following. Fix some real numbers a1 through ab, which we're going to treat as unknowns. Then the lemma says that we can randomly choose precisions u1 through ub uh, from some distribution, such that if you give me approximations a tildes, where AI, a tilde i is an alpha beta times ui approximation of ai, where we call that this is the multiplicative error and this is the additive error, then there is a procedure which allows me to compute a 2 times alpha beta approximation of the sum of the unknown AIs. And this procedure runs roughly in linear time in the number of AIs and succeeds with high probability. So note that basically we don't lose anything here with respect to the additive error that we wanted, beta, and the multiplicative error only blows up by a little bit. Moreover, uh, in expectation, the value of 1 over ui is bounded by polylog n. We're going to see why this is helpful. The way that uh, we're going to use the precision sampling lemma is the following. We set uh, the value of the additive error at the root to be k, as we said. And for each, child, uh, for each node v, which has children v1 through vb, we set the, uh, the value of beta of the children to be the value of beta of the parent times ui, where ui is sampled according to the precision sampling lemma. Now, note that this is precisely what we wanted because uh, once we apply the precision sampling lemma, this guarantees that by combining, I mean, by using the algorithm given by the lemma, we will obtain um, estimates from the children which only have additive error in, in total beta v, which is what we wanted. Okay, with these ingredients, I can now tell you how are we going to get the sublinear running time. And this is the only slide where there are some calculations. So bear with me. Um, the plan will be that at each node being the computation tree, we will spend time proportional to this, namely the length of the string at this node over the additive error that we allow plus some polynomial in k. Now recall the way that we set these additive errors at each uh, node are just the additive error at the root, which is k, 
times uh, some uh, precisions given uh, by the sampling uh, that by the precision sampling lemma. In particular, uh, we have depth many of these, which are uh, along the path from the root to this particular node B. Moreover, the precision sampling lemma tells us that in expectation, one over each of these precisions is uh, polylog M, bounded by polylog M. Okay, so uh, if we combine these two things, in expectation, the value uh, of one over beta B is the following. Well, it's polylog N over K, and the polylog N is raised to the depth of B. Well, we know that our tree has depth at most log base B of N, right? Because it's a BRE tree. And since we choose B to be two to the square root log N, then all of this expression is bounded by N to the log one over K. Okay? Now, <clears throat> the other thing that we are gonna guarantee is um, by adding some pruning rules, which I'm gonna tell you a little bit later, we are gonna, at every point in time, only have poly K active nodes in the computation. By this, I mean that if you uh, see the computation of, the, of this tree distance, we're only gonna have a polynomial number of nodes in which we actually do something, and for the rest of them, we're gonna prune, okay? Now, let's say that we can do these two things, namely spend this time budget and add these pruning rules. Then uh, I can already tell you how, uh, I mean, from these two things, we can already see what is the running time of our algorithm. In particular, in expectation, the running time will be, well, we sum over all active nodes, um, the time that we spend at these nodes, right? I told you that we spend this time. So in expectation, it's just, I mean, we're just pulling the expectation here. Now, by using this bound that we have here, uh, we pull the expectation of one over beta out, and this is the entry law of one over k factor. And here we have just the sum of the lengths uh, of the strings plus some polynomial in k. Now, the sum of the lengths of the string, because at each level of the partition tree, uh, we essentially have a partition of x, then the sum of the xvs is at most n times the depth of the tree. So we can bound this entire expression by just n to the one plus little of one over k plus some polynomial in k. Again, because the number of active nodes is at most polynomial in k, then poly k times poly k is just poly k. Okay, so that was a bit fast, but this is the reason uh, or, or this is the way in which we will obtain the, the, the running time. So now I want to tell you a little bit about the structural insights that we have that allow us to derive these pruning rules. The first one is that for most nodes in the computation tree, there will exist some shift S star such that X equals Y shifted by S star. And in this case, we say that V is matched. And the way to see this is by uh, looking at the standard DP table where uh, these bands here essentially represent the errors that we have, right? And these diagonals correspond to perfectly um, matching substrings, the two strings. Recall that each level of the tree, we have a partition of X and Y. And here I'm depicting the partition of one of the strings by these columns. Uh, and um, essentially, if the edit distance is at most K, then we know that there are most k of these columns which contain some error, right? And for the remaining of them, we, we have a perfectly matching diagonal. So if the edit distance is at most k, then we know that for all of these columns which do not contain an error, there exists such a shift as a star which makes b to be matched. And the conclusion from this is that uh, if we can somehow detect which nodes are matching, and at some point in the computation tree, we find that we have more than k and match nodes, then we can immediately output fire because that would mean that the edit distance is already larger than k. So from now on, let's focus on the match nodes because we know that there are at most unmatched nodes anyways. The second structural insight, uh, for this we're gonna need a definition, which is the block periodicity. Now, the block periodicity of a string x is the smallest number L such that X can be written as the concatenation of L blocks, where each block Xi is a periodic string, right? So Xi can be written as the repetition of some non-periodic string P for some number of repetitions and the length of P is at most K. So as an example, if X looks like this, then the block periodicity is three because we can partition it into these blocks and inside each block, for example, here, uh, this is periodic. So it's ABC, ABC, meaning like periodic just means that it's some repeated pattern 
Now, that is that this measure will allow us to exhibit a structure versus randomness dichotomy, where in one end, if a string has a small block periodicity, then it's very structured, and if it has large periodicity, then it looks random-like. And the idea is that if in these two extreme cases, so if the block periodicity is 1 or the block periodicity is larger than k, then we have very simple rules for already inferring all the values of the edit distances for each possible shift. So here, this plot here is supposed to represent what is, for any shift s, what is the edit distance between xb at this node and this particular shift, where we know that the nodes are matched, so there is this shift s star which corresponds to edit distance 0. And we call this the periodic rule, which applies in this regime, and the random-like rule, which applies in this regime. And unfortunately, I cannot tell you much more about this. In the remaining case, when the block periodicity is between 1 and k, we can argue in the following way. In each level below b in the tree, there will be at most k nodes which have block periodicity larger than 1. And the reason is just that um, since the block periodicity is between 1 and k, we know that xb can be splitted in at most k blocks, each of which are periodic. So in the branching below b, we will at some point uh, hit each of these periodic parts, which will be solved directly by the periodic rule. So in that case, we can bound the entire size of the subtree. So to wrap up, we can bound the number of active nodes in the following way. By our first insight, we know that there are most k and much nodes. And otherwise, if b is matched, then it will be solved directly by one of the pruning rules. Or if it's in the intermediate regime, then there will be poly-k number of active nodes below it. So overall, this means that we have poly-k active nodes in the tree, as we promised. To finish, I have to admit that in this talk we skipped a bunch of implementation details. In particular, in the paper, we give efficient property testers, which first of all decide when is a node matched or is far from being matched. And we can also decide when does a node have block periodicity 1 or is far from being periodic. And both of these property testers run in the time that I promised you earlier. Moreover, we actually do not test whether the block periodicity is large to trigger the random like rule, but actually we uh, twist one of the arguments I mentioned you uh, earlier. In particular, if we are at some match node and we detect that there are more than k active nodes below it, then we can immediately uh, conclude that the block periodicity is large and therefore apply the random rule. Okay, so to finish, let me leave you with two open problems. The first one is whether we can improve the running time of our algorithm to match the lower bound. And the second, whether we can solve the gap problem when uh, in the time budget n over k plus poly k when the gap is now constant. I have no clue of how to do any of this, and I think uh, it would be really cool to see any progress on this. Thank you for listening. <laughs>